Hi, my name is Adam Vaughn. I'm a graduate student at the University of Michigan. And what we have here is a two liter GM Ecotech engine that's connected to an AVL transient dyno. On top of the chair is a Raspberry Pi that has a custom circuit board mounted on it that I designed and built to do data acquisition with the engine. The blue cable is a crank encoder signal that gives us the angle of the crank. And the yellow BNC at the top is a pressure signal measured from inside the cylinder. Uh, we use this to get pressure as a function of crank angle. It's also connected to the internet and of course with power. So what might you use this for? Well, I'm interested in this kind of combustion mode that has high fuel efficiency, but also is constrained by this near chaotic behavior that basically prevents it from being practical, being the kind of combustion mode that you would use for driving on the highway or driving to the supermarket. The approach that I'm taking is an adaptive machine learning algorithm that I designed explicitly for this purpose that deals with one of the main issues of chaotic systems, which is the high parameter sensitivity. It does this through an adaptation routine that runs in real time as the engine is running. Ultimately, what I hope to do with this is to use model predictive control to predict the behavior before it happens and make it go away. Uh, doing this could uh, expand the range that we can use that high fuel efficiency and hopefully uh, bring it to production cars. And finally, I just want to add that at the end of this video, uh, I show a preliminary demo of the algorithm running in real time on the engine that you just saw. But wait a second. Engines have been around for over a century. Surely at this point we figured out everything that's possibly going on inside them. And they're basically a dead science at this point. We should be focusing our efforts on better storage mechanisms like batteries, or you know, cleaner sources of energy? I would say no. Uh, we still do active research in this field with new combustion modes, trying to get better fuel efficiency, and we go at it with uh, uh, optical engines where we can uh, you know, look at the combustion event and try to make sense of what's happening. Uh, we also have uh, complex simulations that are run on supercomputers that deal with uh, you know, the turbulence effects, the complex chemistry that's happening as, as the combustion event is progressing. Um, these are really active areas of research that people still do to this day. And they do this in part because the societal cost is just so high. Uh, if you look at the figure on this page, uh, we as a global species right now are, are using one and a quarter cubic miles of petroleum every year. So that's a mile by a mile by a mile up to the sky. Anything that we can do to improve fuel efficiency can begin to affect this trend to prevent CO2 from getting into the atmosphere to save people money. Um, and I think it's especially important as uh, developing countries begin to consume more and more oil. Uh, they can't necessarily purchase the latest and greatest greenest tech. And at the same time, they are the source of the growing trend in oil consumption. So how can we begin to get greater fuel efficiency? Well, on this slide, I show a highly simplified view of a typical gasoline engine. I have a scale that goes from zero, which is idle, you're sitting at a stoplight, all the way up to 10, which is you have to pedal all the way down to the floor. Somewhere in between there, say zero to six is your daily driving, uh, but these are just representative numbers. And in fact, the whole scale changes if you have a turbocharger. The thing that I want you to take away from this uh, is that when you get closer to idle, uh, the fuel efficiency is not great. Uh, and I show this by a lighter shade of red. As you move to higher loads, uh, the shade gets darker to represent higher fuel efficiency. But you should note that your daily driving is more towards the lower fuel efficiency end of the scale. What's really interesting though, is that you don't necessarily have to burn the fuel with a spark. You can actually mix up a mixture and then compress it until it auto ignites or burns on its own. This is something we call HCCI or homogeneous charge compression ignition. It's a bit of a mouthful, but basically uh, you can get up to 20% greater fuel efficiency and at the same time produce ultra low NOx levels, uh, where NOx is a gas that uh, uh, will ultimately produce smog in the atmosphere. So this is great, but the only problem is that HCCI is completely different from spark ignition, so you can't easily switch between the two. In fact, people are still doing PhDs to figure out how to do that. Um, and at the same time, it's a small range over your daily driving range, and that's a big issue. One of the reasons it's so small uh, is that you get this near chaotic behavior that you can see in the figure. Those large oscillations uh, in combustion timing are really bad. We ideally want to keep the combustion relatively constant and a little bit phased or timed uh, after the piston has started to move back down. So you might say, oh, 
Well, I'll just put a feedback controller on the engine, and I'll make that behavior go away. Well, it turns out that it's actually part of an entire bifurcation cascade to chaos, and each one of those bifurcations brings more oscillatory behavior with higher parameter sensitivity. And unfortunately, in the case of the engine, uh, the parameters that it's sensitive to, we can't easily measure. So this makes it very difficult to model the behavior. And for feedback control to work well, you need to have a good model of the behavior. So what I decided to do was to just take a step back and say, okay, so we can't easily measure the parameters that are driving this complex behavior, but we do know that there's still determinism and there's still regular patterns that are occurring as you go towards chaos. Maybe if we used a machine learning algorithm, we could pick out those patterns. And it turns out that yes, you can. The only catch is, well, you could train the model, but then if you go to another condition, the high sensitivity shows up and the model doesn't fit the data anymore. What I found that you needed to do was to have an adaptive machine learning algorithm, a machine learning algorithm that was learning new behaviors as the engine was running. And so I designed a specific algorithm for that purpose. What I found for this particular algorithm was that you needed something around an iPhone generation one processor to keep up with the engine in real time. This is actually kind of amazing, considering that if you wanted to do a full simulation of the combustion process, it would take about a day to do just one burn cycle. Whereas on a low cost processor, you can actually do the calculation in less than a millisecond. The other thing is that it is a low cost processor, which means we might be able to get greater miles per gallon, greater fuel efficiency, without having to spend a large amount of money to do so. So how do you implement this? Well, the first decision that I made was to go with the Raspberry Pi because it could do the double precision math that I needed fast enough. It had a huge community of support behind it, and it was very cheap at $35 a board. The next decision that I made was to use Linux because it provides the entire Unix ecosystem, which makes application development that much easier, and an existing driver infrastructure with already debug drivers, with the exception of the USB driver, which uh, has been an issue that I've had to work through. The only problem with Linux is that it's not real, real time. It doesn't guarantee when a given task will run. And that's a big issue because the engine continues to spin and you need to be able to issue a command on time. There are various solutions to this. And what I ultimately decided on uh, was the preempt RT patch, which adds more determinacy, uh, less latency to the Linux kernel. It doesn't fully get rid of it, but it makes it much more constrained. And I've measured the worst case scenarios, and uh, I was able to get my machine learning algorithm to run within the window that I needed to run in. The raw pressure data, however, that's needed to uh, generate the inputs to the machine learning algorithm uh, is actually coming in too fast to use one of the preempt RT uh, type solutions. I found that I had to use uh, something called an FIQ, which is an ARM specific higher priority interrupt mode. Uh, the data rate that I'm looking at is somewhere between 15 to 100 kilohertz. Um, the resolution is greater than 14. I'm actually using 18-bit resolution. Uh, and you have as many channels as you have uh, cylinders in the engine. Here's where we last left off before. Uh, the Raspberry Pi is actually connected to an engine the model that you'll see shortly wasn't even trained on. Uh, the engine it was trained on was from two years ago that had a side mount injector uh, versus this one, which has a central mount injector. Uh, this one also has a cam lift switching mechanism with slightly different valve lifts from what it was the, the model was trained against before. Uh, it also has a slightly different compression ratio. Over here, uh, you can see AVL Indycom. Uh, the yellow trace is cylinder one, and you can see it's oscillating quite a bit. That's because we deliberately pulled some fuel out to get to this uh, near chaotic behavior. And over here, uh, you can see a table of a lot of different numbers. Uh, but the main takeaway is that the COV, or the coefficient of variability for cylinder one, is between 8 or 9%, which is pretty high. Here's the web-based user interface, which is getting data streamed to it from the Raspberry Pi. Uh, it's showing four cylinders, but it's actually only one cylinder's worth of data. I just wanted to make sure that the user interface could keep up. Down here, you can see the predictions, which are the colored dots. Uh, and the actual measured value, which is the black dots. So the colored dots are actually one cycle ahead into the future, um, predicting that near chaotic behavior, and the actual measurement is the black dot. You can see that it fits okay, uh, and I think it actually feels really great considering that this actually isn't the engine that the model was trained against. So adaptation apparently works pretty well, uh, which is great from an engine calibration standpoint. And finally, I'm just gonna briefly go over my next steps. 
Uh, the biggest thing that I need to do right now uh, is to get the model calibrated for this new engine hardware. Like I said, it has a different head. Uh, the old data sets that it was trained against uh, had were running at a different engine speed. Uh, they also had a different injection pressure. Uh, there's a lot of other little differences between the two setups that I basically need to update the calibration for. And when that's done, I expect to get results that are similar to what I got with the old training data sets, uh, which you can see in the figure on this slide. Uh, incidentally, each of the blue vertical lines is a harsh transient step of four different actuators at the exact same time. Uh, if you'd like to read more about that, uh, there's a link at the bottom of the slide. After the calibration is complete, uh, which shouldn't take too long because it only takes about 20 minutes to run the calibration, uh, it's just that I haven't updated everything for the new engine setup yet. Uh, the next step is to begin doing cycle-to-cycle -cycle predictive control experiments uh, with this new adaptive machine learning framework. Uh, the hope is uh, that I'll be able to go to new operating points uh, that are enabled by being able to predict this near chaotic behavior and ultimately deliver higher miles per gallon uh, by expanding the range of HCCI.